And welcome back to Educational Triage. This week we have Joe McQueen, the author of Calming Young Minds, which is an incredible book. So, Joe, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us how you came about writing this? Well, thank you. Yes, my name is Joe McQueen. Um, I'm an alternative education principal currently, um, still still active duty, as I like to think of it. Um, so I've been in the field for almost 25 years. I've worked residential and I've worked in detention centers. I've been a, a drug and alcohol counselor. I started off as an LBS1, um, working with uh, mostly behavioral students, students with some some pretty significant social emotional issues. And it wasn't till maybe six, seven years ago, I started developing different trainings on de-escalation and um, just understanding mental health. Probably about five, six years ago, really started deep diving into restorative practices and how that looks. Um, I was doing restorative practices with my kids back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but we didn't call it that. I just called it like family practices. So we kind of pretended like our class was a family and we did family circles and things like that. <clears throat> so after going to, I mean, countless trainings on different um, different things, different techniques and things to use in schools, um, I've been a trainer for, you know, all the things, uh, handle with care, uh, TCI, CPI, safe crisis management, all those things. And I thought, you know, I don't feel like a lot of what's focused on when they talk about de-escalation is real life stuff. Like I'm in the trenches every day. Um, and some of the things that you're suggesting I do, I think to myself, like, hmm, I feel like there's some things you could do before that. So anyway, so I developed these trainings and I started doing them with uh, schools in the local area, I started doing some conferences in Illinois, and then I did some national conferences. Um, and I applied for a national conference. It was Innovative Schools Las Vegas uh, last year, probably around, well, almost around this time. And uh, one of the guys who was a keynote speaker there sat in my session on de-escalation. Now, you know, when you go to a conference, you're trying to do a six, seven hour you know, training and they say you got 50 minutes. So you're really just sort of super superficial stuff. Like, you know, here's some quick tips. Hope you pick that up. Uh, you know, ask me questions later. And so the guy asked me, you know, for my business card and I gave him, you know, I'm a principal. So I gave my principal card and he called me when I got back to Illinois and he said, hey, where can I buy your book? And I said, I don't I don't have a book, man. And he goes, how do you not have a book? And you're talking and, and doing things on the national level. And I was like, I don't know. I just send them my uh, synopsis for my trainings and what it's about. And for some reason, they say, OK, come along. Um, and so I show up and I do it. And he said, uh, you know, man, you should really write a book. And I said, I don't know what I would write a book about. I don't think anybody would really be interested in anything I have to say. And he said, well, you know, at the end of your training, your last slide, you had like six or seven trainings that you do with schools. And I said, yeah. He said, do you keep those up to date? And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, you know, I uh, gear them towards individual schools and whatever they want and, you know, specialize them for what they need. And he said, why don't you take your top three and just put them in a book? And so, so I did. I, the following Monday, I sat down, I opened up all my slides and opened up all the research stuff I had. And I just started converting it to um, a narrative that you could read and that would make sense. And, and uh, when I do trainings, I share a lot of my own personal stories and I also share a lot of scenarios of, you know, kids I've worked with, because I think it makes more sense. It's, it's, I don't like to sit and listen to a whole bunch of data and a bunch of stuff that like universities did and figured out. And like, can you tell me how you did this? Like share with me the last time you were in the trenches doing this. And so I put that in my book too, because I thought, you know, people want to know that this is authentic, that I'm not just a guy who Googled a bunch of stuff and did a bunch of research. Like I've been doing this in some of the toughest environments you can have for almost 25 years. And so that's what happened. Calming Young Minds was born and um, now it's available for people to buy and hopefully read and, and change their lens, their insight on how to work with kids. In writing the book, have some anecdotes that are in there. And those must have been the ones that really stood out as you were starting to hone your craft, I'm going to say in being a behavior specialist and then moving on and forward. And I think it was Philip who said that you treat kids as though and approach them as though they're actually human. Yeah, I think I, I was one of these kids and, and I, I, I say a lot. In fact, I just, I did a restorative circle with some staff members in our, um, the place I worked at this yesterday. 
And I said, you know, everybody brings, when you land in the world of alternative ed or um, even residential, I found over the years, we all have a story, um, something that drew us to those kids. And for me, I thought, you know, these kids are my people. I was a kid that was diagnosed with a behavior disorder. I was diagnosed as oppositional defiant. I was clearly ADHD. I could have been the poster child for that. Um, and I knew what it was like to be annoying to adults and have adults not want me around and, and be bothered by me. And, and just that hurt feeling of, you know, I just want to be liked. I just want to be okay. And you guys don't want me around, don't want to be around me. You know, looking back, I get it. I was kind of a difficult kid. And so I think that when I work with these kids, we, we forget this is somebody, somebody like this is, it's, it's a human being. It's a, it's a little person or, you know, sometimes a bigger person and they see the world through a different lens than you. And it's not a bad one. It's not a better one. It's a different one. And we have to take the time to pause and step back and say, how can I help you? What do you need from me? Um, how can I try the best I can to see the world through the lens you see? Explain that to me so that I can be of better service to you. Because really, that's my job is to help you and to get you from one place to another place. And if I don't approach you like an individual and approach you like, you know, the human that you are and the person that brings all these things to the table every day, this backpack full of all these things, if I don't take the time to help you unpack that, then I'm never going to be effective. I'm never going to get to know you. I'm just going to be another adult that tells you things to do. Right. We don't know the background of these students either, do we? Oh, gosh, no. And sometimes, you know, um, it hurts to get to know it and it's worth it. But taking that time to get to know that the human being, you know, I, when I first started teaching uh, behavioral students, I knew we're not going to get any academics done until we can get regulated in this classroom. And those are all like weird things back in like the late 90s, early 2000s to be like, I need to have my kids regulated and feel safe and feel like they're comfortable. And then we'll get to the academics. So I would spend the first week of school just really getting to know each other, doing some family building, doing some team building, really unpacking some of those things individually with kids. And then when they felt safe and they felt like they could trust me and they felt comfortable, then we can dive into the academics because those things will come. They're all capable of learning. They're all bright, smart kids. We just have to get them to a place where they can start to learn. And I found that most of my kids, even the kids that were diagnosed with like learning disabilities, it wasn't as much a learning disability. It was an educational gap. Um, due to their behavior and due to, in my opinion, adults just not taking the time, they had these huge gaps in their education. And once I filled those gaps in, they were able to go out to regular classes and do regular work, just like all the other kids. Um, they needed support because, you know, high anxiety levels or stress levels or some, you know, like me, they, they had a hard time staying on task or uh, would be a bit defiant. And so we would just teach them skills around that and work with that in the classroom. But I mean, they could do their seventh grade math, they could do their seventh grade English. They, that, that part wasn't a struggle. It was just how to sit in a classroom and regulate themselves and adapt to that setting. And it was surprising that as, as high as I would raise the bar, they never didn't meet it. They met it every time. And I thought, God, my kids are probably brighter than most of the other kids in this school. It's some, you know, towards the end of the year, I thought I got the best kids there is like, I'm probably lucky. Let me ask you a really quick question because it's something that keeps coming up. And that is a lot of the kids have these learning gaps when they come to us. And some of them stopped learning somewhere back in elementary school. And you're secondary. And yes. I work secondary. I started out in preschool, but then I worked, I went up to secondary. So how do you do you do any kind of an assessment on a kid like doing an individual learning plan when they come to you which is separate from uh, an IEP an individualized education plan but a learning plan where you can chart out or maybe assess what those learning gaps are and then maybe figure out how do you work to fill those gaps with the student tell me more about that yeah, we do individualized optional education plans, and it's optional because they're in an optional educational environment. Um, so every kid comes in. We have some canned goals that every kid has, like, you know, show up 90 percent of the time. Um, you know, don't hit people, don't hurt people, don't bully people. We have all those basic goals for every kid. 
But then we dive in individually. And typically, like when we do an intake, we'll have the principal or counselor, we'll have the kid, we'll have their parent, and we'll sit down. And I like to ask the question, like, why do you feel like you're with us? Give me your side of it. You know, what do you think got you here? Um, and then dive into that. And, and it gives you a good idea if they're like, you know, because I'm a bad kid. I'm like, well, you're not a bad kid. That's let's get that off the table. I don't think you're a bad kid. Um, you may have made some poor decisions. So how do you think those decisions affected you being here? Or we have kids that are say like, you know, I'm just way behind on my credits. Well, how'd you get there? What happened that got you there? When did you first start to fall behind? Um, and really talk to them about what their picture is and how they see the situation and then build goals around that. And a lot of times when I ask kids like, you know, we're going to set behavior goals and they're not here for a behavior reason, they get worried. They're like, whoa, 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 I, I don't have any behavior problems. And I have to explain to them, behavior is positive. Like one of your goals can be that I'm going to reach out and ask for help more. That's a behavior. It's like all behavior serves a purpose. When I'm hungry, my behavior is to eat. You know, it's not a negative behavior. When my wife does something that I enjoy, my behavior is I tell her I love her, maybe give her a hug. It's not a negative behavior. I said, so let's not have that connotation that all behavior is negative. Behavior is just a response. It's how you do things. So let's set some positive behavior goals. Yeah, you're not a problem student. You're a little behind in your credits, but it sounds like you struggle self-advocating. Let's make that one of your goals. Let's have you self-advocate and talk about what that looks like and have you practice it. And we can do all kinds of stuff to give you a stronger voice to advocate for yourself. So we do a lot of those individualized things. Um, and we have, uh, you know, yeah, we do assessments. It's a lot of it's online assessments and things like that to look at where they fall and um, what gaps, if they're recognized, we can fill in and, and things like that. Are they pretty receptive to all of this when you're going over it with them? And then when they have to put pen to paper or whatever they're doing in order to learn it, are they more receptive because you've already gone over this and there's an agreement with them? Um, I think it depends on the kid. They're all different. You know, um, some kids look at me and say, you're full, you know, think you're full of crap. Like, I don't believe you a thing you're saying because so many adults and so many educators have let me down that, you know, you're just, you're, yeah, I don't need a lecture from you, man. Um, but that's the, you know, that's fine. We'll do something superficial and get something on paper. And there's a lot of times mm -hmm. I go, look, we're going to put these things down, but you and I are probably going to meet a few times and talk about these things and explore this a little more as we get to know each other. But for today, if we can just get some surface stuff down, some basis, basic stuff down, let's, let's do that. And then over time, you know, yeah, we do open up and they do start to realize that, you know, in my book, I talk about being a solid object, the 10 things to be a solid object. And over time, they realize that, you know, OK, you and, and most your staff, you know, none of us are perfect, um, are pretty solid objects. And we can come to you and we can, uh, you know, depend on you. And, and it makes a, it makes a huge difference. So. What do you think is the most important thing that a teacher needs to know just going in cold their first day of school? Um, that it's not about you. It's about the kids. Um, they're going to say things. They're going to do things. They're going to act in a certain way. And your job's not to take it personally because it's not personal. It's their response to how they see the world. And if something is a little off kilter, that just means you have to build a better relationship. Um, I tell teachers all the time, you know, go home and look in the mirror and just embrace all your physical flaws and all your physical characteristics, because that's visible to all people. Everybody that sees you can see that. When a kid gets angry, when a kid lashes out, they're going to pick the easiest thing they can. And that's going to be your physical flaws or your physical appearance. You know, I said, I know I'm not very tall. I'm a little portly and I have gray hair. So when a kid calls me a short, fat old man, I can't get mad. I'm like, I mean, that's pretty apparent. I'm not that tall, kind of chunky, and I'm old. Like, those are just observations that are reworded in maybe not the nicest way. But I'm not shocked by those things. I'm not going home and looking in the mirror and going, oh, my God, I am kind of a short, chunky old guy. <laughs> Don't take it personally. It just it is what it is. And I tell people, you know, if you're a person of color, they're going to pick that. If you're tall and slender, they're going to pick that. If you're short and chubby, they're going to pick they're going to pick the easiest characteristic. And that's because, you know, they don't know anything about you except for that. And then as they get to know you, that'll become less less of a deal. But the biggest thing is to build relationships. Don't take it personally. And keep in mind that when a kid is in crisis and a kid has an issue, it none of it is about you. 
there's an issue behind that issue, and you are just the safe person to lash out at. Why don't we learn any of this in teacher training school? I have no idea. I've I've um, I gave my book to one of my daughters. She's in college at uh, ASU. She's going to be an art teacher, and she just took her first intro to special ed class. And so I I gave her a book to take to her professor, and I just said, "Hey, from one sped teacher to another, I love you. Thanks for taking care of my daughter." And she started reading through this, and she said, "I should use this as like a study portion for my class because nobody ever teaches you this stuff." And I thought, well. You know, they teach us how to write lesson plans and gather data and, and read test scores and, you know, do all those curriculum based things. But there's an art to get education. It's not a science. It's, it's there's an art to it. And they teach you the science part, but they never teach you the art part. And the art part is going in and checking yourself at the door and giving 100 percent of, you know, just your patience and building relationships and being willing to work with kids through pro they don't teach you any of that i think i mean it's been a long time but i would imagine they probably touch on trauma at some point now in teacher school i don't know um but i definitely think when i go out and i train i do these trainings for teachers it's the big feedback i get is like, i could have used this my first year and i'm like well you didn't get it but you got it now so you can change mm -hmm. now you can't go back and rewind the five or six years that you've been teaching but you can completely change this now. I think one of the sweetest things I was ever told is a guy that um, is a pretty old guy. I'm not sure why he was still teaching. And uh, he came to my de-escalation training. And uh, afterwards, he came up to me and he said, hey, this is my last year. I've been doing this a while. And I thought, yeah, you kind of, you know, look like an old fella. And he goes, I've done a lot of professional developments. And this is probably the first one that I ever felt like is going to change the way that I do things with kids. I've only got a couple of years, but I can tell you my last couple of years are probably going to be way different than all the other ones I've had. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I was like, well, wow. hey, man, you know, that's a bummer that you never learned this before. So was there a change? Um, I went out a few months later to do um, restorative practices with them. And he did say, he's like, oh, things are way different. He goes, for me personally, I've just learned to check things at the door. He's like, I don't get as angry. I don't get as mad. He's like, I just look at them and I kind of feel bad. Like, man, there's something going on here. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's the whole thing. Um, there's something else going on. And he said, you know, I coach as well. And so I have started using this a lot with my players and looking into like, you know, why are you so angry? Why are you upset? This was a pretty small thing and it triggered a huge reaction. And he's like, I just think about there's got to be more to that. And I need to dig into it. And, right. And I'm thinking about Bruce Perry when he talks about this one student and his relationship with the teacher and the student thought the teacher hated him, the teacher thought the student hated him. The kid had issues with his father and the kid was in a foster home. And mm. it's because all it, all it was because the father was a drunk and he was an alcoholic and he was really, really abusive, but he would still visit the kid and he wore Old Spice in order to cover up the alcohol on his breath or mm -hmm. on his person. And the teacher used Old Spice antiperspirant or deodorant. And the kids smelled that. And so just that scent. It was a, yeah, it was a what, triggering event for that child. Exactly. Um, you know, sometimes it's just an olfactory kind of response. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it might not be something that you even think about. It's really amazing how... Little things that we do can make a huge difference to the people around us. Yeah, and and I think developing trust with kids, um, you know, I, I think back to the, the example you just used, you know, if you if that that adult had built a relationship with the kid and put aside the fact that he thinks the kid hates him, um, they would have been able to dig into the idea that like, look, man. This is what my dad wears. And when you wear that old spice, it triggers me. And then the teacher could have done one of two things. It could have said, hey, we all get triggers. Let's work on coping skills around triggers. I'd love to work with you on that. Or they could have taken you know, a different route and just said, there's a million different deodorants, man. I'll pick a different one. Like if that triggers you, I can totally meet you halfway there. You know, I can use yeah. something different. But it's nothing like, let's say, that teacher who was pepper sprayed for taking the phone away from his student. Yeah. That's that's in the viral videos and just 
a couple of weeks before, the same teacher had been punched in the face by another student for taking away the phone. So that, I mean, right there, you have a contentious relationship that's not really a productive one. Yeah. I watched those videos and I thought, you know, I mean, I'm, I feel bad for the guy getting pepper sprayed and punched. I mean, um, but approach is everything. And just watching his approach on the video, I thought I, I wouldn't approach that that way. I mean, I get you got to get the cell phone away, but there's a lot of different ways to do it than to snatch it out of a kid's hand because they see that as aggressive. They see that as disrespectful. And because they're teenagers and they think impulsively um, and they don't, you know, they're not rational thinkers because their brain just hasn't developed to that point yet. So a lot of, you know, they're driven by emotion and impulse. And when they feel disrespected, especially if they feel disrespected in front of a group where they can lose face, they're going to respond in a, in a, in a big way. Um, and that might be pepper spraying you. Um, not an appropriate way. It's not okay. I'm not saying it's all right. Totally avoidable, depending on your approach and your ability to communicate and build relationships with kids and just take the time to explain to them and have a conversation around things. It was it was pretty amazing, though, to see the comments on the video with teachers telling the guy to press charges and just a number of things that were really reactionary rather than being proactive and trying to figure out what it is that they need to do and in order for this not to happen again. Yeah, I think I think we're kind of on a, in a we're stuck in a loop where I think education isn't shifting as quickly as it probably needs to. I think there's a lot of ideas around this, this thought that there should be punishment, harsh punishment. People should, you know, pay in the most extreme way. And I mean, we look at just in, in a country in general, not to get political, I'll keep it super quick. We have the largest prison system in the world. So we're built around this long-term idea that's been around for a hundred years that when you do something, there should be something harsh that happens to you because you should be punished. And I think that punishment isn't nearly as effective as learning from your behavior, learning how it affects others, learning to make a change, really analyzing your behavior. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, like deeper cognitive thinking. Um, and I, I, I talk about it in, in my book and, and, and in trainings. Um, we really want kids to think deeper. Metacognition. Metacognition <laughs> is the big thing that we talk about. You know, let's teach teach kids to think metacognitively. Now, developmentally, that's really hard for them because they brain development wise, but it's great practice because as their brain starts to develop and they can start thinking better metacognitively, they already know how to and the processes and sort of the, uh, all the pieces are in place. But I think really looking at that same approach on behavior is what happened, why did it happen, what was your part, what can you own, what could have you done differently Let's talk about what that would look like if it happened again and in the future. But that needs to happen with the adult, too. You know, what happened with you? What was your part? What can you own? What could have you done differently? And if the adult and the kid have that conversation and they each own a part, they each say, you know what? I probably could have done this differently. And especially the adult, if they go, you know what? I see that. And, you know, what? my approach could have been different. I could have taken a different approach. Um, it's OK. It's OK to say. I may not have taken the right approach or even, God forbid, I'm sorry to a kid. You know what? I apologize. I probably overreacted. I bring a lot of stuff to the table every day. Been a rough morning for me. You weren't the right person to do that on. I'll work on my stuff. I'll own my part. And then the kid is easier for them to own their part. And that's a higher level of trust because they're like, oh, my God, this adult admitted that maybe they could have done things differently, which makes me respect them and see them as a human. 